Hi everyone, I'm Valerie. I'm here with Linda from Color Storms Yarn and we're talking about Weesht. And the chapter we're in is Doubt Yourself, right? Yes, yes. I'm doubting myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you couldn't find your book this morning. That's okay. But I did oh. want to say that you're always telling everyone that I'm from Color Storms. You are from Knitting Fairy Godmother. Mm -hmm. So she's an excellent knitting teacher. Thank you. I feel like I'm slowly digesting this chapter, Have Doubts, and I did finish reading the book, reading the chapter, and looking over the assignments. Um, her One of her assignments is to make a share square. So that's very interesting. If you go on Ravelry and put in the search space share square or square share, you'll you'll see the finished version of this and just the, the concept behind the 28 by 32 rows, I think something like that. And the challenge is to design your own um, fingering weight square, or it doesn't have to be fingering weight. It could just be bigger, bigger yarn. I think the only parameters are the, the size or the number of rows and stitches. And the main idea is to design your own thing, I guess, and face your, your doubts or your uncertainties about creativity and give it a try. Yeah. Have you ever done that before? Have you designed a whole square like that? Um, what comes up for me is that the 28 stitches by 32 rows is the dimensions of a stockinette fabric to create a square. So we have, you know, a stockinette stitch is a rectangle shape. So we need less, we need more rows to get the width, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a square is just so satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever designed a square that big, but mm. I did put it up on my, um, I have some software called Stitch Mastery that yes. easily throws up a grid for you. And so I started the grid and I have some ideas. So I'm going to work on that this coming week. That's so great. Um, I'm working on... I'm marinating on a design idea that's a wedge shape mm. because there's shaping involved, right? Like, so this concept of like starting with your shape and then designing something inside of it is mm. something I'm working on right now. Wow, that's a great challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge. There's a lot of doubt. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I realized that this whole concept, I, I have actually, I have, I did actually use that concept and not realize it. Oh, tell me about that. So having doubt as a creative tool, here's, I brought my, I brought an example of it. So I just finished this um, blanket and it's mm -hmm. made from four panels, one, two, three, four, and mm -hmm. each panel has, has several blocks of sequence knitting stitches. I bought the sequence okay. knitting book. It was mm -hmm. fascinating to me and I thought um, it would be a good way to use this. It's 100% alpaca yarn, so. Wow. And it's so soft. I used a size 10 and a half needle. It's kind of a, almost a bulky weight. Mm -hmm. And I, I bought this yarn before I really understood yarn. Of course, we <laughs> all do that. <laughs> so it sat with me for a long time. Um, but then when I heard about the sequence knitting and thought about making a blanket, I thought, well, this, I think this would be a good use for this yarn. Mm -hmm. So I guess 
where this doubt thing comes in mind is that I had a plan for this blanket. I was going to make it three panels wide and each panel was going to have three blocks of sequence knitting stitches. Mm -hmm. One kind one of- One third, one third, one third. One third, one third, and each one a different pattern. Yeah. So it would be like a sampler. Yeah. So I started and what happened was I got, I did my first panel mm -hmm. and then I did my second panel. And I noticed that it was getting kind of long uh -huh. and I doubted myself. I doubted yeah. the plan what is this really going to look like now that I see how long and how skinny it's getting maybe my plan is not a good idea so I thought about it over a couple of days and changed the plan I thought well if I'm gonna make a sampler maybe it would be okay to have my third panel only be half as long Mm -hmm. and continue it on the next panel so then the panels would be all mixed up so we yeah <laughs> you'd have short wow. ones on this end and short ones on that end and maybe that would be kind of fun to have them a little bit mixed up and then yeah. maybe I could make four panels shorter four shorter panels and maybe that would give me more the size for an afghan that I would like mm -hmm. and that's what I ended up doing and I'm I'm very happy that I stopped and doubted myself and reworked the idea. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that you took it to the one the one step. Like you paused the one time, but you didn't let that halt your progress forward. And you also kept what you already had done. For me, I have a tendency to do the opposite, where I have that one moment of doubt, and that creates a complete do not pass go, do not collect 200, stop, and I cannot move forward, because it's like a colossal barrier. Well, sometimes the mistake pre prevents moving forward, for sure. Well, but for me, it's more about the doubt. It's less of like a, deli um, you know, like putting a sleeve in the middle of your neck. That's a mistake you, you have to rip back and change, right? Yeah. Like we've seen sweaters where that's happened. <laughs> this is more that, that doubt flavor where you're like, is this turning out how I want it to turn out? And so it's yeah. hard for you to make the the flexibility to make the shift and turn it into something that yeah. you can still use. The shifting part. And then I rip out everything that I've already done because it's not how I want it or how I envisioned it. And then, you know, I'm like back at the beginning. And so for me, what's interesting about this chapter is it's good to have doubt, but that can turn into a crutch for moving forward sometimes at least it does for me and I've noticed that as a pattern that's developed is it about not planning well enough because I feel like I over plan over plan so you over plan over plan <laughs> so then there's more risk perhaps then there's more there's more sacrifice if it doesn't come out the way you plan because you planned you put so you invested so much in your planning then, then you sort of are committed to that turnout. For me, with this project, I was not very invested in the planning. It was just a blanket. It didn't matter too much how it turned out. I, I perhaps could have swatched better and understood exactly what this yarn was going to do, you know, and then I would have had more control perhaps over the outcome from the beginning. I wouldn't have had to use self-doubt as a tool, but 
I mean, I think it worked out, right? You've got a really great result. And it's just interesting for me to pick apart the creative dynamic and the process. And, you know, for you, this worked this time and it may or may not work next time. But, you know, we only, we as creative people, we should go back to what works. We should default to what was successful in the past, right? And that's part of our evolution and growth. Yeah. And I think I think I need we think we need to take a pause. I think Cliff needs to talk to me. And I'm gonna go okay. get an example of when I didn't self-doubt and it failed. I think okay. that might be useful. Okay, okay I'll great. Be right back. Okay, me too. So here's an example of a project that I work on where I didn't doubt myself and it failed. Hmm. This it is the project that I mentioned last time that I may have to abandon. It's just so complicated. Um, many years ago, I designed a vest that was knit sideways with um, a bunch of um, slip stitches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I turned it into a sweater. And it's a, it's a really good sample of how this yarn looks when knitted. Mm -hmm. But that's about all it is, honestly. I mean, I doubted myself from the moment I started this project, but, and I didn't listen to myself. I mean, um, it's very difficult to figure out how to make this slip stitch and then increase it as you're going up this neckline. Um, it's hard to explain how to do that in different sizes. Look at this button. It doesn't, meet up with the top right it has this little open piece i didn't make the buttonhole in the right place it's um the arm depth is way overdone and i think i just wanted to plow through it and see if i could do it at all that was part of the reason why i didn't stop and reassess I guess I I figured if I if I stopped and reassessed I would never I would never get it done at all. But the the point is is that it just wasn't a good idea I think to make a sideways sweater with a plethora of slip stitches and then try to make that into 10 sizes. It's too complicated. I okay. love the idea of a mashup and I love that you're taking a sideways sweater combined with slip stitches and, you know, doing this and exactly what you're saying. Like if it's too complex and complicated, the average knitter, <laughs> you know, they may like it, but do they, would they also enjoy making it and why do we, why do we write our ideas down as a pattern in a cohesive format? It's so that we can share the idea and concept with others as a form of communication. So, you know, maybe it just needs a little bit more of massaging or it's not a bad idea and you did it. You executed it from start to finish. Well, perhaps I'm learning this self-doubt tool because last time when we were talking about it, that was the first time that I uttered those words, that I admitted to myself that it was a failed project, that I might have to scrap it. That was the first time I had admitted that to myself. And now I'm talking about it again. So mm. I'm maybe rather than trash it, I should just doubt it and just maybe um, try to keep working on it. <laughs> maybe it's a good idea. I just need to simplify it or something. I don't think it's a bad idea. I mean, I love that you have a finished project from start to finish. That is a success. <laughs> <laughs> It's, and again, like you're, it sounds like you're at this pause point where you're like, well, I originally thought I would make it into a pattern, but maybe it needs some evolution or I don't know. And 
where did we come up with the idea that our knitting has to be commercially? I, I create patterns all the time. I mean, I have yes. probably written a hundred, but I only have shared a few because it's very complicated and difficult to actually write them down. The articulation, communication, and code of like creating a codified, cohesive pattern is way harder, I think, than a lot of people realize. Yeah. And you've experienced that. And some people have no problem just like doing it. But for me, it's an exercise in editing. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting too, because we are participating in a knit along. And I chose an older pattern. It's been published for many, 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 many years. And noticing the difference between an early pattern mm -hmm. and a current pattern, the designer has gone through a lot of shifts and changes. And I don't want to say that it's the designer alone, but it's also how we codify a written pattern as an industry. It's how the demands of a pattern writer have changed. In what and, way would you say? How has it changed from early to late? Well, this particular pattern is a long sleeve pullover. It's start to finish a three page pattern, wow. which for modern patterns, that's a short pattern. Yeah. And I'm thinking about how we know in the Japanese tradition that it's more um, stitch dictionary based, like you're given the stitch, the stitch panel. And as the knitter, you need to know how to shape your sleeves. You need to know when to start your decreasing, increasing, like it's inferred that you would know that information and just layer on top of the lace pattern. Mm -hmm. And so things like that. Yeah. You must be right because, um, when I've, uh, a couple of years ago, I started reading Elizabeth Zimmerman's books and her patterns, and they're also very brief. So I think you must be right across the board that patterns used to be much briefer than they are now. It's the trend to be more chatty about it, and and that that can be good. Sometimes it's overdone, but can be good and like that's where each of our personalities come into play like some people prefer the very bare bones simplified version others like having everything spelled out a row by row direction like it's really interesting too because even the way that some of the, like this particular pattern that I'm working on has a lace panel and it has the written out row by row directions and the chart. And two things I've observed, the row by row directions are written out row by row, but where there's rows that are repeated, it just like for row seven, it says repeat row three. Okay. And for me, that's a pet peeve. Because if you're going to go through the hassle of writing row seven, then you should just put the words in for what the row should be. And as the publisher, just copy and paste the <laughs> So how many words to put in a pattern, right? How descriptive to be? That is yeah. definitely something that we're thinking about as, as um, we're buying patterns, as we're writing patterns. As we're using patterns. Yes. Like we're knitters that knit from patterns. And as a segue back to the book, um, this wonderful dictionary, uh, it's called Scott's Dictionary of Nature, written by Samuel Johnson. He's different in that he tries to use words that are that are less definitive. Mm. 
So a dictionary, of course, is trying to be very definitive and exact as it's expressing the definition of a word. But if you've ever watched that, there's a movie about the, one of the first English dictionaries ever put together, the Webster, you know, the Webster English Dictionary that was originally like 30 volumes. It's quite a process to come up with the definition of a word, and it's not as definitive as you might think. So there was a lot of doubting in the creative process of making that dictionary. And this dictionary uh, by Samuel Thompson um, is so unusual. So I'll give you, I'll give you a great example here. Mm -hmm. The word fleetchen means, as applied to weather, falsely assuming a favorable appearance, as in a day that promises much more than will be performed. <laughs> That's a fleetchen day, is a day that promises much more than will be performed. A fleetchen day. I love that. I think I could add that one word to my vocabulary. <laughs> There's a lot of definitions in here, and I think, you know, she says, whether you enjoy the Scots language or not, whether you have a deep love of Scotland's landscape, or whether this is your first experience of either, spending a few days with Thompson Dic Thompson's Dictionary is a richly rewarding and deeply affinitive experience. Um, you will find that you're, you'll find a kinship and overlaps within your own regional language mm. you know like fleeching sort of sounds like fleeting and and the whole montessori method of learning is to take, take what you know one. and add a little bit to it you you learn from a place of knowing and then you go to a place of not knowing and you can build they're like building blocks so I think I can go from fleeting to fleeching. <laughs> and and how uncertain is weather and nature anyway? You just never know how a day is going to turn out. You never know. Not You're in Maryland. For a delightful surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so self-doubt was used as a tool even in making dictionaries even though it's trying very hard to be definitive it's the thing that stuck out for me is i would not have put writing a dictionary in the creative process like that my mind was blown when when we were talking about that me either i was also surprised <laughs> we've, we've got some some great assignments here. I read a Keats poem mm -hmm. and and um, that had that, uh, what was that word? The negative capability mm -hmm. in it as he's describing, oh, what is it? The Tale of a Nightingale, I think it is. That's one of his most famous poems. Mm. Um, so I'm realizing that I have used self doubt in my creative process a little and I need to keep keep doing that and think of it as controlled questioning, mm -hmm. you know, controlled dismay. <laughs> don't go down the don't go down the deep hole just if you're dismayed in your work, maybe just pause and walk away from it and let it just be self doubt and use it as a tool to move forward. It's a great take on the chapter. So good. Well, thanks for joining us this week as we're engaging with the idea of having self-doubt as a creative tool. Mm -hmm. I hope you're having a wonderful week and thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.